And our next uh, speaker will be uh, Ronnie Drapkin, uh, who is recently joined the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania as an Associate Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Pathology, and Director of the Penn Medicines Ovarian Cancer Research Center. He's also on the leadership team of the Basser Research Center for BRCA as Director of Gynecologic Research and he holds the Franklin Payne Chair in Gynecologic Oncology, and he will present comments on the cell of origin according to the fallopian tube hypothesis. Thank you, Doug. So I have the opposite problem that Alex has. 15 minutes is not nearly enough time to cover all the literature <coughs> that has amassed over the last almost 10 years <clears throat> on the role of the fallopian tube in ovarian cancer, but I'll do the best I can. Um, I thank Alex for his uh, introductory comments so I can jump right into it. Uh, many of us know that the BRCA genes were cloned in the mid-90s, and it, by the end of that decade, we were offering prophylactic surgery to women who had these uh, uh, her hereditary risk for developing ovarian cancer. Now, these specimens afforded, uh, especially pathologists, which is what I am, the opportunity to evaluate these tubes and ovaries for occult cancers with the goal of really trying to understand where do these tumors start? What do they look like? Because until then, we really hadn't been able to understand the early pathogenesis of this disease. As early as 2001, studies uh, from the Netherlands, Pike et al. being pretty, pretty much the first, identified, sort of made paradoxical observations, essentially, that we're looking for early ovarian cancer, but when we find cancer, we tend to find it in the fallopian tube. And uh, this, is what, this is the seminal paper that he published in 2001, where they looked at 12 women, and he mentions here, higher fractions of proliferating cells were found in dysplastic areas and accumulation of PP3 was observed in severely dysplastic areas of the fallopian tube. So that was, you know, in a beginning of a paradox. Multiple studies, which is what this table is trying to illustrate here, by all means not intended to be comprehensive, uh, made similar observations over the intervening years. And one of the conclusions that many of these studies came with uh, or concluded uh, with the data they had was that... Um, Fallopian tube cancer is one of the other cancers you're at risk of developing if you have a BRCA mutation. This together with ovarian cancer and primary perineal carcinoma was sort of the trifecta. If you had a BRCA mutation, you could get primary perineal serous cancer, you can get high-grade serous ovarian cancer, and you can get primary tubal carcinoma. But it really wasn't until around 2006 when Chris Crum at the Brigham and Women's Hospital decided to look at this more carefully and specifically wanted to look at the fallopian tube and the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube, which is where a lot of these early studies were showing early cancers. And so he developed what we call the CFIM protocol. CFIM stands for sectioning and extensively examining the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube, where he would, cross, he would amputate the uh, fimbriated uh, end of it, create many cross sections to expose as much surface area as possible, and look at the rest of the tube, as you see in this lower panel here, uh, in great detail as well. So I was fortunate to be there at the time and, and was part of these studies, and I can tell you as a pathologist, I'll sort of run through a little bit of what we saw for those who aren't familiar with looking at uh, tissue under the microscope. So normal fallopian tube epithelium has secretory cells, which is the big arrow, and ciliated cells, the little arrow. Um, and normally when you try to stain for P53, you don't really see much stabilization of P53. And what we're looking at here, we're, lo we're, tr we're looking for brown staining. We don't see any. And that's because wild type P53 has a very short half-life. It gets turned over by the MDM2 ubiquitin ligase. If we look for evidence of DNA damage as measured by gamma H2AX, which is a histone that gets phosphorylated, it cites the double strand breaks. We don't really see much evidence of that in normal epithelium. And if we look for proliferation, depending on the studies you read, up to about a percent of uh, fallopian tube epithelial cells can have some proliferation uh, in the secretory cell itself. Now, in these specimens that we first started looking at, we found what we described and ultimately called a P53 signature, which is a stretch of secretory, benign appearing secretory cells that express strongly P53 protein, have evidence of widespread DNA damage, but, but do not proliferate. And in about 5 to 10% of cases, we saw a continuum with what we call the intraepithelial carcinoma, or serous tubal intraepithelial carcinoma, stick, which has all the morphological features of carcinoma, retains expression of PP3 protein, the intranuclear foci of DNA damage, but now has acquired a proliferative capacity. And then these features are shared with the uh, clinically evident tumor that we find at the time of diagnosis. Now, the important part is that almost all these lesions were found in the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube. We did not find them anywhere else along the length of the tube. Um, and so you can draw a schematic where you have these finger-like projections. We call them plica, 
where you have normal epithelium that becomes a PB3 signature, evolves into a stick lesion, and then disseminates and invades as a high-grade serous carcinoma. Uh, at that time, most of this work was limited to histologic characterization and basically microscopic studies. So we decided to take it one step further and we used laser capture microdissection to isolate cells from all these lesions in any one given patient to answer two questions. One, does P53 protein mean that there's a mutation in the gene? And more importantly, if you have a mutation in the gene here, is it the same mutation here and here, which would suggest a genetic linkage between these entities? And that's, in fact, what we found. PP3 stabilization is due to PP3 mutations, and this mutation is the same mutation in the stick lesion and in the invasive cancer in any one given patient sample. Now, the interesting part is when we started to look at women who did not have BRCA mutations, because what we found is that in 20 to almost 40 percent of women who don't have BRCA mutations, you can find a P53 signature in their fallopian tube. So it's, it suggests that it's not related to risk. There's something about physiology, and we can talk about what that might mean, that predisposes women to getting these P53 signatures. But remember, they are not precancerous. They are benign cells that have DNA damage in a P53 mutation, but do not proliferate. It's the women who have the BRCA mutations that are hereditary predisposition that can switch into a uh, stick lesion and evolve into a high-grade serous carcinoma. And again, this event is not a very common event, but if you have a BRCA mutation, you're much more likely to undergo it than if you don't. The other things we learned is that mutations in PP3 are the earliest event that we can identify in this cancer. And this has been now supported by the TCJ, which Doug Levine can tell you more about. Uh, which is a, essentially a mutation that's ubiquitous in high-grade serous carcinomas. Essentially, all, all of these tumors have mutations in PB3, and our work says that it's the earliest event. Studies from other groups have shown that you can even see copy number alterations as early as the stick lesion, suggesting that these events are evolving as we progress from normal benign mucosa to in, invasive carcinoma. So when you put together what we learned from the TCGA with the morphologic uh, studies that were done, we come with sort of the summary where you have this evolution of, of uh, neoplastic epithelium from normal mucosa through two precursors. One is a precancer, one is a precursor, um, which is highlighted by acquisition of mutations in P53, DNA damage, copy number alterations, telomere shortening, um, and uh, these are all the features that we've defined as hallmarks for high-grade serous ovarian cancer. So like most things, there's take-home messages and questions that still remain unanswered. Take-home messages that precursors do exist in the fallopian tube. The DCFIM protocol is a clinically important tool for assessing patients who are at high risk of developing cancers and undergo BSO. And that high-grade serous cancer is characterized by early PB3 mutations and widespread copy number alterations. So among the questions that always comes up is, do all high-grade serous carcinomas come from the fallopian tube? Are the stick lesions really the precursor? What are the implications of all this for early detection? Because you can imagine we focus all our efforts on the ovary for a long time. Should we be redirecting our scope and now focusing on the fallopian tube? And how can we do that? That would uh, hopefully lead to methods of early detection. What are the implications for prophylactic surgery? We take off the tube and ovary. Those women undergo a surgical menopause uh, with all the associated cardiovascular, osteoporotic, uh, psychological consequences of that at a very young age. Could we spare them some of that by just taking out the tube if that's, if that's really the tissue at risk? And that's an area of debate and hot debate. Um, and then PV3 mutations, as I mentioned, the earliest event, can that be therapeutically targeted since it occurs in every single tumor and is retained throughout the entire morphologic continuum from the early precursors to an invasive cancer? So I'm not going to stand here and tell you we have the answers to all these, but I'm going to show you some of the data for some of these. So let's start with why do we have, do we have evidence that all high-grade serous cancers come from the fallopian tube? So since the CFIM protocol was developed, I was able to identify over 20 studies around the globe that have utilized the CFIM protocol to try to understand the incidence of these early lesions in the fallopian tube. I'm going to highlight two studies because there's only 15 minutes uh, from probably two of the most significant pathologists of our time, Chris uh, Crum and Bob Kerman. And in their studies, they looked at the co-occurrence of stick lesions in patients who had tubal carcinoma, primary peritoneal carcinoma, or high-grade serous carcinoma. And what they found was that most, in, in almost all studies that they, that almost all cases, 67% of the time you could find a stick lesion in the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube in cases with high-grade serous cancer. 61, 67%, and again, importantly, always involved the fimbriated end of the fallopian tube. They then went on, them and other people, went on and looked at primary peritoneal carcinoma and asked the same questions. In patients of primary peritoneal carcinoma, where the ovaries are benign, 
what do we see in the fallopian tube? And this is now looking at about three studies, uh, one from uh, the Brigham group, the group from the Netherlands, and a more recent study um, on the bottom here. And basically what you find is that if you use the CFIM protocol, you could find sticks in the fallopian tube of patients with primary perineal carcinoma in 47, 45, or a range of up to 56% of the time. So about half of all patients who have a primary peritoneal carcinoma have a stick lesion in their fallopian tubes. So why can't we find it all the time? That's a question that always comes up. Why not 100% of the time, right? I told you 50% for primary peritoneal cancer, six, up to 67% for high-grade serous cancers. And there are a number of studies that have actually looked at this. Uh, and this is just sort of highlighting some of the, the important points. Sampling error has been documented to be one issue. There's a number of studies that have shown that if you section further into the fallopian tube tissue block, you can find a stick lesion that was not there when you first looked at the section. We've actually had experience with that ourselves. There's intra-observer variability. Even studies from Kerman and Crum, who are the leaders in this area, have shown that even among trained GYN pathologists, there is variability in our uh, ability to sort of demonstrate and, and call a stick lesion a stick lesion. Part of that is because some sticks are PPD3 negative, in which case that might you know, make it a little bit harder to call it because we use PPD3 immunostaining as a surrogate and as an adjunct to our diagnostic um, workup. And then transition, transition lesions can be difficult. If it's not quite a stick, but it's before a stick, some people call these TILs or you know, tubal intraepithelial lesions in transition, uh, what do we do with that? And then precursors sometimes are consumed by the cancer, and so there's no normal precursor or no normal tissue to actually evaluate. And then as you heard from Alex, other sources might be uh, contributing to this. The tubal peritoneal junction uh, has been described by Seidman and, and Nellie Osberg. The hilum, as you heard about from Alex. And then recent studies looking at some of these label retaining studies that have impl implicated the fimbriated end as well. I actually think that maybe this is all the same and that we're sort of almost talking semantics because I think we're still in the general vicinity, the very, very distal end of the fallopian tube, and it may be the transition between tubal epithelium and mesothelium, but basically everyone who looks there finds the lesions there. Are stick lesions a precursor? So if you look at the incidence of sticks in isolation, looking at patients who have prophylactic surgery, uh, in three major studies, and there have been others, but I wanted to highlight sort of some of the bigger ones, the incidence of finding a precursor in a woman who is not known to have disease ranges anywhere from 2% in the Sloan Kettering study up to 8% uh, in the study from Canada. And if you add all these together, you have about 1,000 cases. The incidence is about 4% of patients who have a prophylactic uh, BSO because of a BRCA mutation will have a stick identified in their fallopian tube. This is important to note that in the attempt to look at these sections, at least a number of studies have shown that for, by looking for BB3 signatures and sticks uh, in the ovary, we have not been able to find comp a, a, a similar lesion in the ovary itself. So this is a study from the Brigham Group that we were, I was a part of. We looked at 75 consecutive cases where we con con completely sectioned the ovary and tube. Uh, we found uh, signatures in 38% of the, the cases, but only one ovary had a very small, and I remember seeing this very small focus of what looked like PP3 positive uh, cells on the surface, which did not exhibit evidence of DNA damage. No signatures were found in cortical inclusion cysts, which is where we were typically looking for these lesions. And that's since been validated by a number of studies on the bottom here, where no sticks have been observed in the ovary itself. What about experimental proof? So my lab has spent the last six, seven years developing model systems to look at the fallopian tube. I'm not going to spend time talking about all these other ones. I'll, I'll highlight the mouse models, which seems to be what most people get excited about. Um, so we, um, oops, yeah. So we developed one mouse model where we used a PAXA promoter to drive expression of Cree. Uh, thank you, Doug, for summarizing my work in this one slide. Um, and in this model, we use the, the PAXA promoted to drive expression of Cree and delete out the relevant genes as defined by the TCGA. And when we did that, we found that we could get um, early cancers that looked indistinguishable from sticks in humans. And these shared all the histological, immunohistochemical, genomic, and even clinical aspects of disease. Uh, we showed these tumors elaborate CA125. They exhibit uh, extensive copy number alterations. And one thing that we did notice was that at the bottom, as you see here, we did surgical outcome studies where if you do salpingectomy as expected, you don't see transformation of the fallopian tube. Um, but if you do oophorectomy, which we were not targeting, we found that, yes, you don't interfere with transformation of the tube, but you actually interfere with the ability of the disease to progress as widely 
as we saw when the ovary was present. And this was consistent with studies from Karen Liu's group uh, that was published in 2011, where they showed that the ovary may not be the necessarily the, the site of origin, but it seems to be the dominant site where these tumors like to grow. And it may be that a seed and soil hypothesis or other aspects of the ovarian biology, which are not unique to tubal cells going there, because we know a lot of metastatic cancers like to go to the ovary, like Krukenberg tumors of the stomach and so on. So it seems to be sort of a magnet, and that's an area that requires more investigation. Uh, another study came out from uh, Pat Morin's group at uh, Hopkins where they showed that using a different promoter, the OVGP1 promoter driving SV40T antigen expression, they could get uh, early lesions like PV3 signatures and sticks just like we described that were PAXA positive, had all the hallmarks, uh, the immunohistochemical hallmarks of the disease that we had demonstrated. Um, and again, you know, suggesting that really the stick lesion is a precursor even when you use multiple different methods for trying to target the fallopian tube. And so in summary, we concluded that the fallopian tube can be targeted in vivo, that by doing this with uh, disease-relevant alterations, we can recapitulate the pre-invasive and invasive components of carcinoma. The stick lesion is the precursor of high-grade serous carcinomas. The mouse tumors retain expression of all the tumor and serum biomarkers, and I didn't get to show you too much of that. Um, and also the genomic instability of the disease. Salpingectomy, as predicted in these models, prevents tumor development, but the ovary seems to be playing a role that needs further investigation. And with that, I'll end, and uh, we'll take questions at the end. Thank you.